in Paris, in Australia. There are so many uh, carriages. And the, with the traffic increasing, the top engineer at that moment, the top expert, they also had an international conference to discuss the, the potential crisis. Because they estimated around the 1944, yeah, the whole Paris will be buried by the Menu. The whole window will be uh, covered by the menu. So it's called a menu crisis uh, prevention workshop. But that, that workshop didn't make any uh, conclusion because they don't have a, a suitable solution to solve it. So that's why we feel if it's uh, according to the traditional way to solve the crisis, it's not, not works. So the there's no way back. It's simple as today. With the 4K, with the VR coming, with the AI coming, there will be a similar crisis with the current network if we don't do the massive change. So, except innovation, there's no way back. Similar as SDN today, that we have to move on. I think SDN in the past five years is a hot topic. Everyone talks SDN. But now, I do believe SDA is a you know, turning point. <coughs> so, according to the past experience, we learned a lot from SDA. It's, it is an architecture rather than a technology. It, you cannot just based on a simple protocol to change the world. <coughs> it is a network virtualization rather than disaggregation, although it's, a, it's also important for, for doing some disaggregation work. But it's a, we need to understand the cause of SDN related to the business. Business is the key. Without bringing the new revenue, without bringing the lower cost for the network, without bringing more high efficiency for the resource of the network, and also without touching the new opportunities. If we talk in all the, all the traditional services, there's no, no business uh, we are bring to the customer. There's also no future of SD. So we think business is the key of the game. That's why in this year we from Huawei as an industry uh, player, we announced our controller based on uh, open source owners and we call it Android controller. Our intention is to design for the business and from the business based on the industry open source code. So the, there are three aspects. We, this Android controller covers the four business scenarios. Although we, we know the scenario will keep on coming, but at least the current the major scenario from campus, from one, from big center, from IoT, <coughs> we all need to consider it. Then we cover the solution should be extensible. Second is uh, you need the design for the controller meet all the business demands. That's what we think is most important. The top three demands is from the customer's service automation and also bring more value added service. And also bring the intelligence and optimization capability to the network. The third one is and also the most important one is the open ecosystem. And I emphasize on the business ecosystem. So ecosystem is everywhere, but we need to really connect the technical ecosystem, community ecosystem with the business ecosystem. So this will make, make our controller design for business. And according to our estimation, within the next three years, it's critical for the uh, industry. And at least more than 1,000 sets of controller should be deployed in the, in the industry. So, who can embrace this uh, trend? Who can embrace this business opportunity is most important. Also, it's critical for the technology, for the community to become more success. Okay, so I don't need to mention how open source is important. Compared to the traditional workforce scale innovation, it's, it's a long time to mature and there's, there's no, no much ecosystem around it. So, 
somewhat close. So the uh, but from open source community, all the party from standard, from product, from application vendor, from custom point of view, they all can <coughs> access the requirement together at the same time and bring the free the idea innovation to the community and to the industry as fast as possible. So that's why we think open definitely change the game of the innovation. Everyone should embrace it, same as Huawei. And uh, talk about the open source, we think uh, the, the main value for we doing the open source is to make it open, but the key value it could bring is the ecosystem. So the ecosystem, the open ecosystem is a key success factor for the open source community. And I always use this diagram to show that this idea is clear. There are two similar size of uh, area. One is called Hawaii, one is called uh, Costa, Costa Rica. They are both in the tropical and uh, have active work on just the same size, same latitude. Just a quarter of the earth away. But after millions of years of uh, evolution, the, the ecosystem in this area is really different. The species in Hawaii only 20,000. And because it's isolated from the mainland, it's a closed ecosystem. And it's bare and it's vulnerable. Everyone, if you fly to Hawaii, you will be uh, through the very strict check to, to guarantee you, you didn't bring any special species and, uh, to the end because uh, it will hurt the ecosystem. So it's very vulnerable. But for Costa Rica, there are 25 times of species, and each year there are diversity and more new species comes out. And it's just because it's a bridge of the continent and it's collaboration with each other in the, in the ecosystem. And it's really prosperous ecosystem. And the ecosystem is robust. It's not rely on any single species. The, the food chain is very, <coughs> uh, there's no single failure, single point failure. So that's why we think even its ecosystem, if it's uh, closed or open, it doesn't matter. It's, uh, so that's why I take this example to bring my idea about uh, our open source community 2.0. I think uh, in the traditional IT world, the open source works because it brings a high, high efficient collaboration between the developers. But today, when we talk about the SDN controller, all these things, it's somewhat different. Just assuming the students here, who will build or deploy a, a network in your apartment, build a virtual router in your apartment to test, to program, that's not, not impossible. That's also not valuable. That's why we think we need to upgrade community 1.0 to 2.0 based on the Costa Rica open access in example to bring the bridge, collaborative, prosperous, robust features in the 2.0 community. It's not only bring the high efficiency collaboration amongst developers, it should bring the high efficient collaboration throughout the industry. Not only the developers, also include the vendors, include the research institution, just like here in the university, also include the standard bodies, and also testing and certification organization, as well as the network operators. So this is uh, we are bring and uh, creating a more prosperous SDA ecosystem. Also talk about this uh, uh, 2.0, one of the things we think uh, collaboration between the communities, both in you know, standard body and also in the full stack for open source is the most important. And also we should take the responsibility to trans transform and turn in the concept and standards to running code in each 
standard body. Another one is we think uh, we always talk about the business use case, but nowadays most of people in SDN world just talk about uh, cloud routing, VSLAN, or SD1. I think this is also important, but uh, but it should not be only the story. Because this now uh, which is just a traditional service. It may bring some convenience to the end user, but it's not bring too much new revenue. So that's why we think, uh, except the cloud routing, we should also expand the new service to some OTT uh, service, some vertical industry service, and also there are a bunch of new opportunities, new business like cloud, like IoT, like video, and the SDN should also embrace. Rather than just focus on OPEX saving or CAPEX saving, that's far not enough. So business opportunity behind SDN is far more than cloud routing. So I, I ask for the whole owners community think about it. Another thing is we think. Uh, in the future, to embrace the open, open ecosystem, we should build the best platform for the industry. So the key technology yesterday, I think uh, uh, many experts shared. I'd, I'd like to emphasize again, from a real perspective, we think it's more important. So cloud native, more than, rather than cloud ready. So the microservice, the decoupled layers, extra, is more important. And the high performance, reliability, scalability, throughput, and extra, and make it a zero downtime and more reliable. Third one is adaptive. It should be modern driven and also adaptive automatically to all scenarios, make a, reduce the code, manual adjustment as much as possible in runtime. time in running time. So the, of course, this is not only the technology we should uh, think about, but I just uh, share our thoughts. So we welcome all the community to, to contribute in all the aspects. And also, as an industry player, we are proud as an owner's partner. We can say here we are the founding members, and also we, we do contribute to the community based on our has uh, 30 years industry experience. And also, we also launched our industry force owner space, the force scenario under controller. And uh, finally, last but not the least, is I'd like to use this uh, picture. This is a traditional China, China, Chinese painting um, to show the, we call it uh, ecosystem. So, you know, there's a saying in China, we said, that is, uh, if it's only one flower, we cannot call it a spring. Only the hundred flowers, uh, call, we mean uh, it's a prosperous garden and spring comes. So I call for hundred flowers blossom, that's bring out uh, the really the spring coming to the industry. And finally, I'd like to use this uh, page to end my speech. And uh, I'm very glad we have this uh, meetup in, this, in the Paris, in the uh, in this university, with this all the young talent here. And I, I'm sure owners, you know, very good movement and very good shape. And I hope and I wish owners the best or nothing. You deserve this. We all deserve this. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. It's very exciting to see how Huawei is turning, uh, you know, what we're doing here as a community into a product. So thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, please, everyone, help me welcome uh, somebody from another organization in the community, NTT Communications, who's going to be speaking to us as well about what they're doing with the work that uh, our community is doing. So please join me in welcoming me, Dai Kushima.
Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I am Lai Asilas from Indic Communications. I am really happy to be here and uh, to be here to share our views of SEM adoption in the near future with you. Um, today, I'd like to explain, explain about the SEM technology development strategy in in the communications and application region of month. First of all, I will explain briefly about the, our history of SEA adoption. Uh, about uh, four years ago, we have uh, launched the first SEA adoption service in commercial services inside the data center. Um, with this service, we would like to achieve automate <laughs> Uh, automated uh, complicated, complicated configuration and modification of network appliance settings using SDN technologies. We uh, adopted the open flow switches and open flow controllers as network controllers, and we also provide the customer portal to manage the SDN. And what is the result? What was the result uh, for us? Uh, we could uh, decrease. <laughs> The, the OPEX dramatically by the, I'm sorry, by the process automation or by the customer operations. And for our customers, they can, they could uh, easily manipulate of uh, crowd resources to the customer portal very easily. And the next step is the uh, between data centers. We expanded the SDA adoption to the between data centers in the next step. With this service, we have deployed value-added network functions like dynamic connectivity and uh, bandwidth on demand, or something, uh, with SDN technologies. So, um, um, and also, um, uh, we provided the customer portal as well to manipulate the, the, these functions. So, um, we could uh, realize this type, this kind of uh, value-added SDN services in very short time using same technology, using same SDN technologies. The next step is between data center and wider network. This service is for on-demand and seamless operation between data center networks and within networks. <laughs> And with this service, we have provided within our building customers with automated connectivity to our cloud services. To realize this service, we have developed our own SDN controller and SDN uh, switches using open technologies to map between uh, PLAN ID inside the data center and the MPLS ID inside the VPN networks together automatically. So with this service, our customer could easily set up and modification network resources per end-to-end -end basis. That was a brief history of our ICN adoption. And I will next explain about our next steps in created with the uh, SDN adoption. Um, this figure shows the uh, current uh, SDN adoption region, as I expect, as explained before. Uh, the current SDN adoption region is inside our cloud environment, our data center environment, our own cloud environment. Uh, we name it the, uh, the service name, the enterprise cloud. There are several activities to expand this <coughs> technologies. But uh, they are categorized into two directions. The first direction is horizontal expansion. Uh, we plan to expand the region from inside our data center, so inside our cloud environment, to external cloud environment, including Amazon's AWS or Microsoft's Azure or something. Uh, we uh, call we call the, the, this kind of service SD, software-defined cloud exchange service, 
and we will run in the near future. And the next direction is vertical extent. I mean, um, I, we plan to expand the SDA and adoption region to, from cloud environment to wide area networks or global area networks region. There are two hot topic in this region. The first one is SD1. Uh, many, many uh, presenters have already explained before. SD1 is, as you know, uh, the overlay type of SDN adoption. Okay. The another one is transport SDN. Transport SDN is the underlay SDN expansion of, of in divided networks. Uh, in the rest of my presentation, I will explain a little uh, detail about the transport SDN because we believe uh, transport SDN is the uh, most uh, promising uh, adoption, promising uh, application region for all of us. This figure shows the uh, current transport network setting in my company. Uh, this is an example in uh, the current setting in uh, Japan. It is a multi-domain uh, environment, including access domain and the packet and optical transport core domain. And it also is a uh, multi-layer and multi-vendor environment. Uh, there are three features to explain about current transport network settings. The first feature is distributed network function deployment. I mean, uh, intelligent uh, transport network functions like uh, multi-layer conversion or uh, like uh, uh, intelligent maintenance or management functions like ESA OAM or something have been deployed, have been de uh, distributed all over the Japan and all over the world currently. The next feature is hardware-based aggregation. As you know, um, current traditional transport network device have a lot of uh, functions, a lot of intended functions based on hardware. The third feature is isolated NMS and EMS. Um, in current uh, management functions, the management control functions and control systems have been really isolated per vendor basis or per kind of uh, net, uh, network device basis and so on. It's very isolated, no relationship between them. These are the, the distinct features for current network settings. We'd like to transform these features into like a 2D feature sets. The first goal is centralized network function deployment. I mean, I, we plan to cent concentrate and centralize the intelligent transport network functions into more narrower areas. Uh, we need uh, transfer further. We'd like to put more and more value added functions into only to the transfer fabric in the near future. The second feature is the uh, software based disaggregation. We'd like to deploy or adopt as much uh, the, the general powers hardware based on the white box as much as possible with value added software. The last feature is API integration with the uh, transport network controller. <coughs> uh, using APIs, we like to integrate the control function into one uh, integrated transport network controller. With this concept, we'd like to realize several value use cases. For example, the network virtualization for a multi layer, multi domain basis, or monitoring of resources and flows and workloads like this. 
In addition to that, we'd like to expand our functions. Uh, for example, using uh, uh, data analysis, a big data analysis or something, uh, we'd like to see the, for example, uh, fault detection, uh, earlier fault detection, or customized operation automation or something like that. Another use case is the uh, network path optimization beyond multi-layer, multi-domain map. The last one is port discovery, is the, in the area, in the environment of multi-domain. Yes, um, we to uh, realize these use cases and uh, to the architecture, we have written down, uh, we have designed the, our SDA transport network controller architecture like this. Uh, there are four layers inside the SDA uh, transport network controller. The first layer is a service business model layer, we call it. With this layer, our operators or our customers can easily set up the transport network path between two and two and two endpoints in really generic and really intent-based manner. For example, our operators request a uh, network path between uh, request a uh, uh, transport network path with a parameter of endpoints and required boundaries between them and required reliability between them. And this request is passed to the next layer. We name it a multi-domain, multi-layer optimization layer. The request is divided into several domains, several domains topology information like this, like uh, uh, being topology or end to end topology or fabric topology or something. Then this request is moved on to the, to the, the next layer, network configuration layer. This layer, the, with this layer, the request is compared to more concrete network configuration, like the configuration or fabric configuration. And the last layer is device configuration. With this layer, the, all the request is divided into each node configuration. Um, this figure shows our ex expected product scope to realize these four uh, layer functions. Current NMS and EMS, we believe, uh, can cover these two lower <coughs> layer functions. And there are several commercial SDA controllers that cover part of these layer functions. For example, Cisco NS1 PCE can cover the over three network layer functions. And at last, we expect it, we are expecting that the uh, owners can cover all these layer functions like this. But uh, to realize, to implement these functions, we think that there are a lot of things to do, a lot of issues to be implemented, to be tested inside the ONS. This at least shows our concrete <coughs> requirement to achieve my, our view. Uh, the, uh, green item shows in the strength of bonus, and uh, this uh, red item shows our requirement for bonus. Uh, I don't have any time to explain the detail about this, but uh, we have already uh, started implementation part of. Uh, these, these red items in packet of scale use cases in ONOS. Um, I don't have enough time, but uh, uh, the, the detailed plan will be introduced in the community show, showcase session today afternoon. So if 
your interest in them, so please participate in the community showcase session. At last, uh, I will briefly explain about our deplo deplo deployment plan of, of Transport SDM. Um, about the third topic, we have, to be honest, we have already deployed part of our SD transport network control function using commercial base uh, product uh, already to, to our commercial transport network. But we'd like to expand the functions, uh, hopefully using the ONOS. And about the first step, uh, centralized network functions deployment, we plan to do POC next year. And about software-based disaggregation, we continue to do uh, technology development currently, and we hopefully do POC in one year uh, to two or two years. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing what NTT Communications is doing with others. And to build on that, I'd like to invite the members of the industry leadership panel to join us here on stage. We're going to uh, spend some more time talking about how others is being used by the organizations in the community. So, um, again, we will be spending a little bit more time talking about how the industry is making use of others. And if you have uh, questions, we certainly invite uh, you to participate. Uh, and to start with, we do a quick introduction, and then I'll hand it off to Myra to Vanilla. Uh, but here on our, on our panel today, we have uh, David Bainbridge from Sina, Adnan Salim from uh, Radisys. Uh, we also have Zinni Lee from Huawei. Uh, and, and Mario Campanella is our moderator today. And uh, as we saw earlier, we have Kachiva from NTT Communications. And lastly, uh, Dominique and Verscher from Nokia and the Labs. So thank you all for joining us today. We look forward to hearing from you. <laughs> so, thanks for joining. I think this is an industry panel. So, Honos was created starting from research and now it's moving very fast to the industry. Um, I think that the first question is about we already know that there are a lot of advantages in using Honos for the industry, but I would like to have the opinion of the panelists about the pros and cons of using Honos as a um, Okay, let's start from <laughs> my left. So the question actually talks about the pros and cons of SDN and OS. So I, I think they're relatively two different things. Uh, the speakers this morning talked about some of the pros of going to SDN. And I think what we're seeing in the industry is, uh, is more and more cu customers looking to say, look, the key here is automation around the network. We've been asking for it in a long time. And with the SDN technology coming to maturity, we're getting that capability. And they can use those pressure vendors like herself to work towards this direction, allowing network automation through common interfaces, getting levels of network extraction and push that down so that they can quickly implement business models that not only lower 
uh, expenses, as we talked about, but that more importantly, bring in new business models, bring in new capabilities that they can put in the network faster. Because you're not going to become a leading customer just by cutting costs, or a leading uh, carrier tool just by cutting costs. You're going to become a leading carrier by putting out new services, bringing new revenue that way. In terms of bringing in owners, um, the pros and cons are owners is an open source software capability, which means customers and vendors alike can share ideas, code, and work together to come a solution. The cons what I see in terms of the open source and ONOS, and even SDM some extent, is maturity. And as they deploy this in commercial products or to put it in labs, we're going to find errors that we didn't expect or didn't see in the test scenarios. As we scale this out into production networks, it's not tried and true yet. And those are the cons that we're going to see. And that is going to perhaps slow some of that uh, adoption in the industry. But eventually we'll get there. It's just going from a relatively mature case technology to things that aren't quite as mature and proven in the industry. And that would be the cons. Thank you very much, Mr. Flynn. Yeah, thanks. Actually, um, I pretty well agree. I think that um, the the whole software open source industry and the networking being open source now as part of STM and Bonos is is a trend that is, of course, really because of two main reasons. One is to reduce the cost of the infrastructure, but I think more importantly, it's not a reduction of the cost of the infrastructure. And these are interrelated things that more minds and more hands have access to creating things instead of a few. And that's called the democratization of technology, which is SDN and OS is part of. And through that democratization, including more minds and more hands can have access to technology, will create more innovation. It will increase more innovation. It will, as a result or consequence of that, will also reduce the cost. So the pros are, I think, fairly, I think, at least one thing I think the industry kind of agrees that the, the pros are, are fairly obvious. The, the cons, and I think it's not really the cons, but it's more the challenges. The challenges are that when you have more minds and more hands on it, you do have to make in the end a, a system that is actually reliable and resilient and gives the end users what they're expecting in terms of quality and innovation and services. So having more minds and more hands in terms of open source and open technology is great, but in the end, it has to be it has to be reliable, resilient, with the expected quality. And I think that. I wouldn't necessarily call it a con, but it's more of a challenge. I think that's the challenge that I think that not just unique to SDN and honest in general in the open source community, that's to be a challenge. And many open source projects in the past have succeeded wildly and some have failed. And I think in, in the end, that's what it's going to ultimately come down to in terms of SDN and honest as well. And I think it's often a great start. There's lots of innovation, lots of open source, lots of help and Larger community that's that's been behind it, which will make it more resilient and more efficient in the market. Thank you very much. Uh, Robin from Huawei. Uh, I work uh, I'm the chief actor of Huawei Owner Space Andrew Controller. Uh, for the past year, uh, regarding the owners and SDN, the past year I have done the response for the architecture design. Uh, based on the owners and the open source. Uh, the result, uh, I can see, that the uh, open source SDN controller does work, though it faces a lot of challenges, but it truly does work. So this is the first thing. The second thing I want to mention, just uh, on Monday, I proposed my draft in IETF because I'm a six years IETF player. Uh, this is called a network of artificial intelligence. So I think the controller is the brain of the network. If you think you, how you can use your brain, you can do everything. So you think about the controller. So I think though we do a lot of things in the past years, but I still say we are still in the early phase in the early phase of the SDN phase, uh, SDN year. So I think uh, this is a great opportunity to the owners and the open source controllers. So though we face a lot of challenges, and I definitely, I think that we can overcome the challenges through our owners, through our community, 
because through the open source, we can increase all sorts from the world, from the world. So that's why I'm here. I like how owners are open source. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, no one actually killed anything bad about owners. So <laughs> I think everyone is <laughs> Please. Yes. Um, Ross and Cons. Yeah, um, about Cross. Um, as I explained the, the, the previous talk, uh, we have launched uh, the analysis and we could dramatically uh, reduce OPEX. OPEX. So this is a very clear cross. Uh, cross. Um, we actually have not uh, increased the CAPEX yet, but uh, this is very clear cross. Um, but uh, I think the most important cross of using SDN or using ONOS is the, uh, how to say, uh, career driven or hour driven service development style. I mean, uh, before SDN, or before open source, community, open source uh, our uh, service strategy or service specification uh, have really relied on the, the network uh, equipment program, or network equipment function program, really. But uh, after SDN, or after uh, open source, uh, we I think we can uh, develop our own services freely and rapidly using uh, by implementing the value added functions by software by ourselves or by our partners or by previous uh, open communities. This is a very big cross. <laughs> uh, about cons, uh, I, uh, there are reasons we should become. But uh, uh, honestly, uh, after SDN, we, we have a problem to, to uh, figure uh, isolation because uh, <laughs> as we said, we have uh, provided the uh, more dynamic functions or more fine grained uh, flow manipulation function to the customer. So when something some, some failure occurs, it is very difficult for us to isolate the the, uh, the uh, program or uh, uh, maintenance point for us. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, just for the students, the OPEX is the operational expenses and the CAPEX is the capital expenses. When I started many years ago, actually buying a computer was very expensive because the hardware itself was very expensive. And running the computer was my expensive now. I think that what we are seeing is the opposite. Actually, the hardware is very cheap, but the software and the maintenance of the software and operating the software actually is as much as the, as the capital expenses, or even my experience is even three or four times the larger in a certain number of years. So, thanks for that. Okay, thank you, Mauro. Uh, first, thank you for inviting me for this. Uh, Industry panelist, I think it's, uh, it's a good uh, opportunity to uh, to debate a little bit more on pros and cons. I will start a little brief story on where we come from. In fact, in the late nineties, maybe some of them, uh, some of you, have heard about MPLS, multi protocol uh, level switching. That was, in fact, was. Uh, uh, concentration of the three uh, packet switching technologies that like was uh, IP, ATM, and frame relay. And ITF, in fact, exploded with uh, this MTLS architecture that was, after that, adapted further for transport network with the MTLS uh, transport profile and also further for optical networks with uh, generalized MP, uh, MPLS multi protocol level switching. The problem of uh, this architecture was uh, uh, the concept was really to push the distributed control function towards the noise, to have very uh, autonomous systems to be deployed inside the network. Alors, it brings a lot of value in terms of scalability, in terms of um, uh, 
uh, great in terms of, uh, uh, should say, recovery, automatic recovery of, of the network. But the problem that the network operator was facing was definitely that it was <coughs> difficult to find a global consistent view of the network. The network states was a little bit complex to understand because of this autonomous system uh, evolving. And what is the real added value of uh, SDN, uh, SDN Paradigm per se? It brings back the logical central view that was in fact forgotten from the network management system that was developed by different uh, equipment vendors. And what is also way more, it was pushed by uh, open source community. And that's why it combines the open source, meaning that it uh, offers, uh, I should say, a way of standardizing this uh, centralized network management system. And this is, I think, the great uh, added value on that. The missing point and the points that is coming from that that we forget a little bit the concept of connectivity. Uh, SDN is really uh, addressed towards network element to configure these different networks through a certain interface that, that was initially pushed by uh, Stanford, Stanford University and Lab with OpenFlow with a different version. Uh, just to configure equipment and to leave uh, with this uh, flow, flow table and to leave it like that. And we missed the connectivity approach that was in fact brought by uh, MPLS for the uh, lab, uh, label switch path. Uh, and this is, I think, a missing point that maybe SDN architecture should uh, push further. But the great advantage is it brings more scalability, more stability, and more uh, better knowledge of the, of the network. And finally, one point also that was missing from the previous uh, network control architecture, it was programmability. In fact, uh, ITF mainly pushed to a very a strong standardized protocol with the GMPLS, with SPFT, with uh, RSVPT, but uh, for uh, uh, those that knows a little bit uh, specification will uh, understood, and didn't offer any interface to uh, program or to let third party application to be integrated inside the network. And this is, uh, I think, why uh, GNPLS has uh, found its limits uh, there, and where, it, in fact, SDN can capitalize from that to, in fact, uh, really have a strong deployment in a network, uh, uh, network operator uh, systems. And uh, finally, to, uh, to see, uh, to, to, to finalize on the uh, pros and cons, uh, the pros is definitely that it's open, open source. It's open. There are uh, well different interface for programming uh, third-party uh, application. Uh, the cons, and I think we will come back for later, is uh, openness, uh, the weakest things of openness is uh, uh, security. Uh, this is also a breach for other uh, attacks, but we will talk about that in the next one. Thank you very much. Do you want to have some questions? Uh, yes, there are. Because actually it took a little bit longer than expected, but I think there are some very questions. Yeah. A lot of uh, ideas have been put on the table, so I think some questions. No? Okay. So um, I think that uh, most of these I was actually discussed, so I can only ask just one thing from each of the panelists, <laughs> they can say, because otherwise uh, it will be a little bit too long. So, uh, it's not what you like in honors, but what you consider in honors important for the industry. I mean, what is the key message that honors brings and the key value that you can bring to the industry? This is the question, just one thing, please. <laughs> 
I think the word you used up there is innovation. I think what it allows not only customers and vendors, but um, to innovate and separate products together, what I talked about in the first hand. I think having that open source capability, that open source project to design and you know, new network topologies and new network uses, absolutely you know, one set of spending if they don't spend it today. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, one um, key thing that uh, we and a lot of people in the industry and the industry are involved in the issue is, is the What's called the port project, CORD, a central office redesigned as a data center. So, essentially, the telecom networks of the last 40 plus years have been full systems in our harness, um, and this kind of controlled networks with virtualization technology and the segregation of all the stuff put together is now getting all the carriers around the world to redo their telecom infrastructure in a fully virtualized and segregated way. SDN and bonus is a key part of that. Uh, my, <coughs> my point of regarding this uh, problem, my answer, uh, my, my think that the most important is the source and the human. Yeah, so since uh, for the past six years, in order to find the essence of SDN and NIV, I had dinner with all kinds of people all kinds of experts more than 2,000 times. Yeah. So uh, you, this is uh, maybe you think it's unbelievable, but it definitely happens. I have dinner in uh, uh, almost uh, every place, Silicon Valley, in you know, Paris, and also in Europe and in China. But now I think this is uh, high, time consuming. But I think if we use that the open source and we use that owners, we can increase more people, more source in the community. So I think the community, the human, the source is the most important one. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, first, um, the high availability or high scalability. These features are uh, very <coughs> important for us. So I like, I uh, really like the, the honors, the architecture. And another thing is that Onos is uh, distinguished the Onos community or Onos architecture is distinguished in the, uh, uh, the gov like, uh, governance of the architecture. Uh, I, think, uh, I think that uh, Onos is a very, uh, have, Onos community has very strong uh, architecture view. For example, yeah, I, we believe that there will be a lot of applications in the near future using ONOS. And uh, I believe, we believe that the, the, the common function, the basic function inside the application would be upstream to the core of ONOS, the framework of ONOS. I think the, this type of uh, feedback would, would be very important for us because we can easily uh, upgrade our uh, our functions using the, the core functions, no easy. So uh, the feedback loop is very important for us. Okay. Uh, what uh, uh, I think personally that is the most relevant for ONOS and SDN architecture and specifically ONOS. Is uh, uh, the first that SDN bring and can bring, in fact, because it would depend also how it would be really deployed inside the telecom network infrastructure or network infrastructure of quantities of scholars. It brings the possibility to have a very streamlined architecture. Means you develop your application, your third party application, you can write. ONOS is there to, uh, to uh, integrate it through its uh, normal interface, REST API, transport API, and so on. And it provides also very well uh, defined uh, server interface with, uh, to enable the configuration of uh, uh, device or network equipment. And if we <coughs> keep this, uh, this line, I think it will have a chance for you to uh, go uh, for uh, real deployment 
and will be uh, used by uh, different uh, network operators. And this is what I like, and I especially like uh, the openness of open flow that in fact enable through experimental message to develop some uh, additional uh, configuration capability on, uh, on, uh, on the network device. And it is, I think, a very strong uh, support for virtualized network function developed by uh, software, uh, by any software developer, in fact. It can be a company, or it can be uh, uh, such as Nokia, it can be uh, uh, small uh, students. It opens the possibility to develop this uh, network, uh, virtualized network function, to integrate it very quickly and they specifically to uh, validate on the, I should say, the net, uh, network control platform. First, this uh, virtualized network control function, and once it is uh, proved, it has been validated to really go to the deployment phase for a real network uh, operation. Okay, I think that everyone is very happy that it's open source. I would also say that it is almost the model of vanity app, which is first try to do things and then demonstrate the work. So thanks a lot. Can we go to the next question? The next question is, as it has been hinted, the human capital is essential for innovation. Because really, all these systems, almost and other software-based networking has been made through innovation through human capital. Um, the challenge for the industry is that the human capital so is it suited to use these new paradigms and these new technologies, this new way of doing things? Especially because it's not just networking, but it's also computing, it's also storage, it's distributed systems. So it's a real challenge also from the competence of the human capital. What do you think? So I think there's, there's two aspects when I look at how businesses are going with this. They, a lot of businesses have been set up and compartmentalized in these various different. Here's a, uh, a group that deals with networking. Here's a group that deals with storage. Here's a group that deals with something else. And as you, you rightly point out, what this SDN is doing is bringing all those together. And so they've got kind of those business boundaries that they have to work with and understand how that's going to happen. And that's a challenge for businesses. Further, when you look at the technologists that they bring into it, you have a network engineer versus a software engineer. You see these blending today. That you can't just have a software engineer and the software gets to be a software engineer that does networking or an networking engineer that does software. And so you have to have individuals of these single competencies, and that's a hard thing to find today, right? Um, I think the university system has to start educating students in both of these practices. And as those students come out, the industry will mature as well. Uh, you have older people who are in the industry trying to learn other. Uh, the disciplines, and that also is a challenge for them. And the industry has to allow for that because you have tremendous knowledge already in your business in the network, and those network engineers have to understand the sweet DevOps and how this is going to work. And I think this is a human problem that businesses are running into right now. Yeah. So, um, so I think yeah, I think that similarly in those lines, I think the, um, the human capital involved in this new model of open source and technology has rapidly uh, been, that is changing and allowing this rapid innovation and reduction in cost does require a different way of creating um, applications and software and networks. And that's continuous integration and continuous deployment model. That if you don't spend an entire year to build one thing, what they say, build quickly, let it fail, and then correct, and then readjust. And iterate. Um, that's the that's the the DevOps model. That's the continuous integration, continuous deployment model. And having open source technologies and things allows more people to have access to that technology, and they are rapidly able to create uh, to, to create applications rather than waiting the traditional longer periods of time to create an application. So I think it definitely does have, have a shift in terms of the, the mentality or psychology of support. Engineer software to the forward. Uh, and I think the industry just has to adopt to that because the adaptation, being able to adapt to that, will then provide uh, opportunities for uh, for people to get more into, into, this, into this area. Um, 
Is it too material? Yes. Uh, so regarding this one, uh, human capital. So this, uh, I believe this uh, to people's uh, opinion. So uh, I want to add uh, some, something. <laughs> yes. So I always want to explain my thoughts on the uh, orders, not the technology. Always think about this, the feeling, human and the this one. <laughs> but this one is the same and regarding this one. I think uh, now that the, the success, successful story had happened in the active so the Facebook, Google, and also Linux and this one. And for the past years, we know how the networking. At that time, they move slow. It's okay. But today, they say OTT move very, very fast. Why? Because it has a healthy ecosystem. But for us, as a closed ecosystem. So we, why we need the open source? We need the orders. So we can borrow a lot of technology and let enhance our competence and you, that is get more uh, people involved. And uh, every people can do contribute to the network. Network IP is not mysterious. So that's that's the thing. And also go out, just I mentioned at the first uh, uh, preface I said artificial uh, network artificial intelligence. What an artificial intelligence? It reduce, reduce the man's burden, reduce the people's burden, save your time, you can do other things. Yeah, CCIE, a lot of, you need a lot of the special experience, special with the technology. Maybe tomorrow is not necessary. You can do other, more important things. Okay, yes. Thank you. Okay, proceed to OTT is order to talk Google people who is focalized on information and as you know probably the amount of information you have to move around the world is very high google and facebook have just announced that they will deploy 120 terabits optical fiber cable between the united states and asia because they think they need all this capacity just to shuffle our data around <laughs> Uh, this is the other opposite. Uh, I think that from my experience where I live, we are now discussing that the network is becoming invisible because what people is interested in is information. Nonetheless, it's very complex to make an invisible network. Yes. I really agree with the uh, human capital is essential for innovation. Um, about the career's point of view, uh, <laughs> There are a uh, lot of network uh, engineers inside the company, but uh, uh, the, if we uh, lack of uh, software development, uh, because uh, before SDN uh, and we, uh, there is little work to uh, design or implement software inside the careers. But after SDN and if we can be software developer, that uh, would be uh, very essential. Uh, I think, especially for a software architect, architect, architect is very important for us because it is very important uh, for us to uh, evaluate the, the uh, framework uh, uh, realizing SDN and if we uh, services. Uh, and it is also important to uh, de determine the boundary of the services are designing APIs for uh, program languages or uh, su suitable framework. Really important. So we lack uh, of uh, software architecture, software architect to, to, to realize this. Okay. I think uh, the human capital is uh, definitely essential for uh, uh, for uh, for uh, the de deployment, the development of uh, the uh, SDN, especially for Windows uh, software. And I would uh, and I would uh, invite uh, certainly the research uh, 
uh, institution or academic research institutions such as the University of Paris here to uh, create some uh, a group of uh, students or some groups of uh, developers to play with for those to realize some proof of concept to develop that because in fact in Nokia Bellas we are interested by these people. These people that take pleasure to realize, to prove, to demonstrate, to think further and out of the box, uh, considering that in Nokia, uh, open source is in our DNA. We like to investigate, we like to discover what we can do with uh, existing open source and to prove some new concept. That's why I would uh, uh, invite uh, you, all of, all of us, uh, uh, all of you and uh, me included also to, to play with one of to play with one of us, to run some uh, scenarios to uh, take into account some uh, previous presentation we have seen uh, yesterday uh, on that and to realize some proof of concept and to uh, and to show and to, to speak about that and this is where uh, the innovation will come because people will start to, uh, to interact and to develop further new concepts and new approach to invent and to invent the future. Thank you. Any question? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I guess I'm going to follow on the comment of the last speaker. Sorry, I missed the name. So I think he was interested. Yeah, um, I'll visit on, and I go to Huawei. So, um, exactly, uh, I see in a recent interview, I was traveling, and uh, they asked me exactly the same question. Uh, the human capital is more than just the human as a resource, it's just the investment. Uh, and that investment in terms of training, education, the basic uh, of the, the foundation of the education system, especially if you're here in, in this great university. Uh, I definitely want to uh, propose that the academia and industry, they should have, uh, they should revisit their curriculum. Because when it comes to training the new generation of engineers and architects, uh, we want to ensure that, based on the demand and supply in the industry, uh, the DNA, we were talking about uh, uh, Robin and, and my colleagues last time, the DNA of the company is uh, rapidly changing. So they focus from like a hardware-centric uh, era of uh, uh, technology is shifting to software-centric. So then we need to bring that idea into the basic, the foundation of the curriculum of the engineering schools. Uh, and we need to uh, perhaps give a weight to where the, those new engineers and the architects should be focusing on. Teaching uh, um, the hardware stuff that are becoming a commodity is probably going to lower the value and priority and we need to emphasize more on the software programming and the skills. Uh, we are even software, if you are a good software programmer, but if you are not really a good like Java coder, uh, still you cannot uh, bring your full uh, potential uh, to, uh, to contribute to this process. So I strongly uh, suggest that we need to uh, send a message as part of a takeaway of this uh, conference to uh, engineering schools to uh, basically promote the, uh, the idea that the academia and industry they need to revisit this paradigm shift, especially in networking and the change of DNA. Thank you. I, I think this, yeah, this question is also because it's, we are in the university. Unfortunately, the time doesn't match very easily. And still, I think programming is an art. So it's very difficult to talk to people. Any other comment? There's a comment there. Uh, yes, uh, my question is about uh, 
Security, yes. Are we going to discuss security in, uh, from the point of view of the FDN? Because uh, the, having a controller who controls all the network in the configuration is very good, but uh, having that uh, compromised by another uh, uh, hacker or anyone. So, are we going to discuss uh, security in, uh, with the FDN? It's very crucial nowadays. And uh, my other question is, is the moment we're going to run on, because it's going to support multi-vendors and uh, equipment, uh, is it going to run on the, as an OS in the vendors, or is it going to run on top of the OS? So that is my question. Uh, <laughs> so, so the first question is the next one. So we will talk about security now. Focus on the second thing. The second is uh, is Onos going to run on top yeah. of the Avengers OS or is it going to be the OS? Well, yeah. Uh, I hope you want to come in briefly. I, I think that now the even virtualization is there. Who is in top of who is, is difficult to decide, but anyway. I mean, all, all of the software projects run on top of those elements, right? Um, I don't see it becoming personal the OS when you when you do uh, I'm a very big proponent of kind of the container deployments for microservices. So I would like to see almost be not necessarily just a process on it, but running a container management system, Mesosphere. Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, and become a part of a larger ecosystem. We see this a little bit in the core that we talked about, where it's just one of many components. And I think we're going to see this more as we see orchestration across the industry. That own a sort of controller feel is a component in an overall solution. It's not the center of the solution. It's used for certain things. And the TSD talked about this yesterday as well, saying, look, we want to be a controller, do one thing, do one thing well, kind of leads mentality, which is perfect. And there's going to be other uh, projects that come into play to do big data analysis, big data, big data collection, uh, expert systems, those type of capabilities uh, on, to bring a complete ecosystem together to solve the networking issues that customers have. And we're going to see best and great integration of the a larger play in the industry. And then again, the, or the orchestration across those big companies. Any other yeah, news? Sure, yeah, that was actually a really good question on security. I'm glad you brought that up in the because we had that question as well. Um, I think this is really key, uh, an important point that I think open source technologies and virtualization and cloud deployments, security becomes more, more of a concern. If you have a closed system, um, security is less of a less of a good It's a concern, but less of a concern. The more the open system is, the more it's likely vulnerable to, to, to security attacks. But uh, on the flip side, the good news is that the more open it is, there are more, as I was saying earlier, there are more minds in the hands behind it as well to defend the security attacks as well. So it just kind of escalates the, the, the level of openness of the system, more vulnerabilities that can attack, but then there's also more people now because it's open source and open source. So security from a user, user's data protection perspective, with the user's content, user's access to their information, must be secure. And on, on the flip side, the, the carrier or the service providers is providing us, the consumers, the network, we have to make sure that the network continues to run in a secure way. So, so from both sides. Uh, uh, security, we will discuss security. But, uh, I just want to finish this, uh, this question about uh, uh, which operating system is costing what? And I, I think that is a very difficult question in the sense of company and open source and the fact that we are moving very fast will make that difficult to take a decision exactly what and it's exactly on this type of answer. Uh, do you want to specifically comment on this issue? Uh, if I may, I, I'm just uh, just to comment. I see definitely almost as a kernel of uh, as a network control point. Uh, where the uh, basic and fundamental uh, function are there, and it uh, 
pour ce nombre de sauts de capacité, tout développe une fonction according to what telecom network operator wants in terms of operation. Because each operator, each OTT, over the top uh, service provider, has its own way to operate its network infrastructure. And sometimes it's even difficult for them to understand which is which are the workflows that they are using for that. And uh, this is the reason why I think it will be uh, the kernel with uh, Linux, uh, Ubuntu, whatever. And on top of that, it offers the capability to customize it for a different deployment or different network segment. We have seen, for example, for data centers, for metro network segment, for core network segment, or uh, over uh, home networks with IoT, for example, Internet of the Things uh, networks. And I think it's uh, where, uh, where I see at least uh, Bruno's uh, playing the fundamental role. Okay, thank you very much. I think now we can go to security, which is a hot topic today. Maybe you have heard uh, 10 days ago the uh, millions of uh, denial of service computers in attack in the in the United States. So this is very important and from my point of view, if I may suggest, um, Onos is a very complex environment anyway. So the more complex the environment, the more difficult it is to ensure that there is a full security. So should we think to secure it in a different way also? Yes. Well, well, it's interesting, as a question you pointed out, uh, now one controller in charge of a large portion of your company. So as you say, that one entity is compromised, all of a sudden, a lot of the systems compromised. And, and that's a very dangerous concept. And so these systems do have to be tested uh, to prevent this, right? And you have to use other networking technologies and other software and all around that. The other thing I think you see, particularly in the open source market, I think it's another question about how do we just stop open source, is in a closed source, a vendor application, typically, a vendor will have an organization that's in charge of security which means they're going to be looking for security breaches in the software and then can put those in high priority fixes. When the open source market, you can use an open source, if there's a security breach, all of a sudden the question comes to the customer, who do I call? Right? Who do I call to get this fixed? Wait, you know, I can't just post to a done list and say, hey, there's a problem, someone please fix it. I've got to do it from here. And so vendor organizations have to come into play to help support open source software to take on those roles of support for security in particular. And until we get actually Onos and all these open source projects deployed in real production networks in, in high scale, high usage, and we start seeing attackers attacking us, we're not going to see all the security vulnerabilities. We don't, today, to be honest, have enough people hacking away at it, trying to break in uh, to pick out what's going on. And so there's a huge risk, I think, in this area, and it needs to be addressed before these technologies get in wider production use. Uh, I think the security, the, in fact, the contact issue later regarding uh, this uh, student's uh, question, uh, maybe I can show you a picture about what uh, security issue we should uh, to, uh, to cope with in the SD year. Okay, so regarding this question, I want to say that the, the first, uh, I just want to give you an example how the uh, SDN can help uh, improve the security because you know that uh, our, in fact, in the network, IP network, sometimes will be attacked. But you know, once it's attacked, it's very difficult to locate, uh, locate the failure patterns. For example, the OSPF or SS flooding, flooding packet. You don't know where is it, where is it. But if you use the SDN, you collect uh, the more information you can easily to locate the issue. Yeah, but this single one, even in the IP network, is what we call the network crack. So I think that this example can uh, verify the SDN's value in the security area. Uh, but this is just one hand. On the other hand, I want to say, yeah, SDN, in fact, propose other security issues because you are software. You can also be attacked. If the brain is the brain is a cut, the brain is a crash. What will happen for your network? Just like mine, if you kill your brain, what will happen? 
Yeah, so that is also the problem. So that you must to guarantee your brain cannot be cut. All your brain needs to be cut. Another brain can take over the job. Yeah, so this is, this is also the lesson we learned from the learned from the the SD development. So this I just wanted to go on to introduce my SDN design philosophy. Yes, so the past years that is, uh, everyone thinks SDN is is one thing can do everything. I said uh, today I told this is a lesson. In fact, uh, this is a network, this is a system, the separating device is a separating to guarantee it, it measures to guarantee security. Network need measures to guarantee security. And controller need measures to get to, to guarantee the security. So the whole system is a secure. Or else if you only depend on or your belief, depend on somebody is definitely it will really crash. Yeah, that's all. <laughs> About the security issue, I think uh, there are two aspects. The first aspect is how to uh, avoid security risk under the SDA environment. And the second aspect is how to uh, provide bilateral security functions using SDA technologies. About the first aspect, this is very difficult to avoid security, security risks completely. Um, to be honest, our company, there were uh, several security incidents. <laughs> but uh, from the experience of us, uh, 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 most of the security risks uh, would be uh, uh, countermeasured uh, by uh, the, the proper uh, setting of the surrounding company. I mean, uh, uh, we need uh, proper security settings or firewall settings or uh, network design to be very important. So we have to check the design, all design of the system. And, and uh, I think it is very important for us to check the, the setting continuously. It's a very simple, basic, but uh, it is very important for us. And about the second aspect, uh, I believe that the security uh, application or security, security functions would be a key application of SDA learning. Uh, currently, uh, there are uh, uh, several uh, security functions to be implemented using NFT technologies, like uh, budget file or budget advance. Budget IDS or something like that. But using uh, SD technology more, we, we think we can provide more value added security functions. Like, uh, for example, when it, uh, there is a DDoS attack to, to the network, mm -hmm. with this SD technology, we can uh, redirect the suspicious traffic to the, uh, another location or to, to the analyzing point. Or uh, um, to the uh, to, to the point that our operators can handle the suspicious traffic uh, properly. Uh, this is a very simple example, but uh, security is very promising uh, to, to to realize our value-added service. Okay, uh, I will. Uh, I finish, that's why it's not easy to, uh, to answer things new from what has been said. But I fully agree with uh, Dave uh, uh, concerning these two aspects. The first aspect concerning uh, attacks on the SDN controller is, is fundamental because this is the brain, this is where you control the network. Having a bridge on the control of your network, you are the master, of the, you are good of your network, and it's, uh, it's done. And this is a very critical point because, in fact, SDN promotes open uh, APIs for software developers to access to this uh, network operating system and to deploy its uh, uh, SDN apps. 
And this is, I think, the, the real uh, compromise between a rich community of developers, a rich community of researchers, developing, playing, and producing a lot of software, and the security. And this is a, a balance we, that needs to be found uh, between these two uh, opposite uh, directions. And the second point concerning the users, because it's true that users don't want their data to be uh, compromised, they want to preserve their privacy, they want to be sure, for example, uh, government institutions want to be sure that their data are not flowing outside their countries, because for uh, security reasons, we, we know all of the Snowden uh, problem, etc., etc., the NSA, etc. And this is uh, definitely an area of uh, research where uh, Nokia already has a lot of solutions developed for that. But uh, I think the, the way to encrypt data, the way to uh, define different level of uh, encryption, protection, intrusion detection uh, function is, is very uh, fundamental. And this is where uh, I think uh, it will be an ongoing work that will never end because once they one uh, security application will uh, be available, I'm pretty sure that some hackers will be ready to break that and to bypass this security function. That's why it's a very uh, rich and uh, stimulating uh, environment for, for business. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think that in any case, as it is open source, I think the contribution to each of us to the security is essential during the famous attack in the United States few weeks ago. Uh, there were many, many printers. There were many, many low uh, devices that have been misconfigured. So this is, for us at least, a lesson that also working with the end users is essential. Um, I think the, the panel is closing. Before to close, I want uh, I can I ask the panelists, if possible, since there are students in the audience, if they have any advice or any suggestion for them, given the right work that we are trying to uh, let you know. Please. <laughs> Don't be afraid to fail. I guess would be the best thing, right? <laughs> Try something. Don't just sit there and wait for something else to do. Something to happen to you. Do something. Um, I've seen this throughout my career. Uh, the best people I've worked with have not necessarily been people from the best institutions. They've been the people that have been able to look at a problem, understand the problem from various different angles, and just charge forward. And if they fail, they correct it in line, and they can't move. So, don't be afraid to do something out of your comfort zone. In fact, thrive on it, right? Try that new thing. If there's a piece of hardware you haven't touched, touch the piece of hardware. Or if you're a software engineer and seeing this problem over and over, the software engineers get terrified of hardware. Go in there and unplug something. If it breaks, yeah, money will fix it. So, <laughs> just be brave and courageous, I guess, would be the advice. Thank you. I think in a similar line, I think that this is it is a fundamental shift that's happening in technology. I think even for your students, I know in the software, a software student 30 years ago in computer science and learning programming languages. Now now the model is really shifting. And I think that it does not only just take a super bright person that and only a few of them. It is now open that ideas are more important now. And the technology is, is there and more readily available and, and more easily understandable and, and more fluid now in terms of technology. Ideas will count and implement the ideas because open source is allowing more complex ideas to be implemented more quickly. And that's what the new shift about, uh, about the scope of the, the trend is happening now. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I, I want to say that one. In fact, uh, in, uh, in Beijing, I also to visit uh, several the universities and uh, to uh, take part in the SD conference. 
Yeah, and in fact, I am always inspired by the eagerness of our students. They say, open source, oh, I like it. If you tell me what I do, I like doing it free. Don't, I don't need money, I will like it. I want to contribute. So I think I'm very uh, inspired by their eagerness. So I, I just mentioned at the beginning uh, about this, uh, about uh, the uh, SDN. I call it as series network artificial intelligence. That now that we are in the early phase, believe me, we are in the early phase of the SDN. A lot of opportunities exist for you. Okay, you can take it, you can contribute it, you can build the new world, build the new world. Yeah, and later they definitely is a, maybe a software world. Even don't be afraid of network, don't be afraid of IT. Yeah, not uh, with peers. In fact, at the beginning, IETL, that one, the philosophy is running code. But later, maybe it's lag. But now, we restore the essence, the running code. Yeah, this open source is coming. Please join it. Even you, now, you join this world. Even you, later, you found that this world is not okay, it's not suitable for you. You can still, based on the technology, learn from this open source. Learn from the owners, learn the, the, some of the IT software technologies. You can also join some of these the internet companies like Facebook, that's Google, and even future some of these robot companies. Yeah, definitely, this will definitely happen. Yeah, okay, that's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> This is going to be, uh, please look at the World Wide Market. Um, in, in Japan, in the past, uh, we have developed our software inside my company or inside Japan. Japan market is different, but it's a cross market. But the, this kind of uh, old age was over. And nowadays, uh, we have set up uh, the big, uh, International software development team uh, from uh, Europe, from Asia, from uh, America. So, um, so it is very important to, to look at the worldwide market. Uh, this is my solution. Thank you very much. Well, I try to add another uh, uh, feeling or recommendation uh, on that. I think we are uh, going uh, and seeing that we are going through a five generation of uh, uh, network with uh, the convergence of wireless network and the transport network. And I think uh, definitely through the different projects that specifically on those propose with uh, MCOM, ECOM, etc. But it will be an enabler. That's why I think on, the, on this way, you have already, or you students that want to uh, involve that, the capability to learn from that. And also not only to learn, but also to see some realization, some ongoing project that are in fact available on the web. You can see, you can try, you can extend, you can deploy on your computer, you can really make some, some use case. And I think it's a very good uh, basis for developing that. And my second, uh, I should say, recommendation, if I may provide you some recommendation, there's uh, SDN as a very strong or very weakest link that is security. And this is definitely a bridge that we should uh, all together uh, being concerned if we really want uh, ONOS being uh, pushed further uh, in real uh, network operations. And this, and this will be my, my second, uh, second recommendation. And the last, but not the least, uh, have fun with ONOS, play and develop and enjoy it. <laughs> I think that the ITF motto was uh, running code in draft consensus. From my point of view, also the draft consensus is essentially this environment. And with these, I think that our plan is over. I would like to thank you again, please, all the speakers. Thank you.
Yeah, I'll say a quick word about what's coming up. But yes, to, to reiterate, we said thank you tomorrow and the panelists. So, and if you have questions for them, they'll be around. So please grab them and continue the conversation. And just two quick uh, uh, minutes about what's coming up next. As Mark said, there is coffee outside. We're running.